Hey, everyone. Hey, Jessica, how are you? Pretty good, how are you? Doing well. Um, we're just waiting for other folks to jump on. Everybody, welcome to the weekly uh, legislative update call from NC Child, and we'll be getting started here in just a few minutes. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. This is Adam with NC Child. We'll be getting started here in just a couple minutes. Thanks for joining us. Morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll get started here in about two minutes.
Hey, testing audio. Can folks hear anyone talking? I couldn't hear Adam when he was starting to speak. Can folks hear me? Oh, I can hear you. Okay, and I hear Matt's audio. Adam, we weren't getting your audio. Can you test it again? Oh, it looks like we have lost Adam. This is not good. Um, okay, well, I'm I'm gonna. <laughs> Sorry, folks, I'm going to jump in and start the meeting since we're past 11 and I know we need to get rolling and hopefully we can get Adam back. Um, I'm going to welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. You can see the agenda up on the call. And just in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and hand things right over to our friend Matt Gross from NCDHHS to get us started. Thank you so much for being here, Matt. Hey there. Thanks for having me again. So let me jump in with a few updates. Um, it's been another big week for us on trying to continue to increase data transparency. So if you are avid followers of our dashboard, you may have noticed a few uh, items we've added. One is weekly COVID-like uh, surveillance data, um, how that compares to the previous two flu seasons. And that's one of the big trend lines that we're following is from the EPI team. Also added the trend line for laboratory confirmed cases, the trend line for percentage of which cases are positive, the trend line for hospitalizations and the trend line for total tests performed. So that is all available on our website under uh, the key indicators tab. Additionally, I know there's been a lot of questions about congregate care outbreaks. Um, we've added a uh, report that's gonna be updated twice weekly at 4 p.m. on Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, there's a congregate care update where we are listing the names of the center, the congregate care settings that was a bit of a challenging decision I'd say there's you know there's with all these data decisions there's that balance between what is a good level of transparency so people are aware of what's going on while also trying to not uh, put patient or resident confidentiality uh, in a bad place and that was a bit of a challenging one but that's up there um, the link that I sent to uh, NC child which I'll get out to y'all later is the link that will be updated uh, twice a week with that new information Looking at more things on the data transparency front, I know folks have been very interested in data about uh, uh, risk factors and how many people that are hospitalized or have passed have had risk factors. We're working on getting that updated in the near future. Um, also, the CDC, I forget if they, I don't recall if they actually did it yesterday or if they told us they're going to announce it today, but they're coming out with a formula for calculating recovered cases. So once that formula is finalized, we will follow that formula and post that information as well. So that's I say news on the data front. Obviously this week was really big from a legislative standpoint. Um, they're actually still negotiating the bill right now. I know last night they hammered out the, well, so procedurally the Republicans hammered out the money side of the bill last night. My understanding is they're sharing that with democratic leaders today to see how they felt about that. Um, the big number, it sounds like kind of split the difference between where the house and the Senate were. I say a few things I wanna highlight from this week's discussions. We did a lot of work, particularly on the Senate bill um, with Senator Blue's office. Uh, those of you who track this closely probably saw an amendment that Senator Robinson ran uh, late in the day on, I think that was Wednesday. Yeah, I think it was Wednesday. Um, notable things in that amendment that we pushed for to get into the Senate bill, $20 million to DHHS to support local health departments and mental health crisis services. $25 million to support food banks, residential services, um, special assistance, adult and child protective services, support for the homeless, domestic violence shelters and housing security. Uh, $61 million to serve rural and underserved communities. And that underserved communities piece is really important. I know there's been a lot of discussion about the way this has had communities of color and, and folks that we tend to already see um, struggling due to the health disparities that we know are so sadly present across the state. And that's money that's really important to, to serve, to provide extra supports for those communities. Um, also worked with them to get an additional $22 million to bring the full uh, school nutrition package up to the $78 million that was in the uh, governor's package in the house budget. So was happy to get that amendment in the Senate budget. I think that put them in a better place for the negotiations that happened last night. Don't have a full readout on where that stands, but I think we'll get a sense of that today. I know they're planning to hammer out some of the policy items today, I think with the goal of voting on the bill on Saturday. So we'll have a good sense of what's in there. I know there's a lot of policy items to be hammered out between the House and the Senate. Um, looking at my list of things here from Fawn, 
Oh, another big question that was been a lot of talk about we're, what's going on in the in the uh, reimbursement place for the uninsured population. So, you know, I, as we've covered on previous calls, I know that we, we've had our proposal to raise Medicaid eligibility up to 200% of federal poverty for people who have COVID-19 so they can get treatment and testing with the treatment really being the big part of that. I'm thankful to see the House supported that amendment or supported that provision and put it in their bill. It was not in the Senate bill. I frankly don't think it will be in the final package. And much of that is because as I mentioned last, I think I mentioned last week, CMS has still not signed off on our, that part of our waiver. And while they didn't tell us no, they told us not yet. And that paired with the announcement this week that HRSA is now going to be providing funding for treatment and testing for the uninsured population. It doesn't appear the federal government's going to approve that waiver anytime soon. So I think the focus is going to be on how the HRSA money can get spent. I sent a link to uh, NCHL they'll be able to share with y'all um, from HRSA about this COVID uh, an insurance payment they're doing. I will say there's a lot of questions and uncertainty as to how that money's going to work. We don't know how much it's going to be. We don't know how it's going to get allocated. We don't know if it's going to be first come first serve. Um, and then if it's just going to then run out in, in that scenario, we'd be very worried about the impacts for North Carolina because we know that some states that got hit harder, faster, like New York would of course have a lot of need. We've been able to keep our COVID cases at more of a slow boil. So where our, our need is important, but not as critical as New York's at this moment, we think it's going to continue on. So we just don't really know how that's going to work. We don't know how they're going to pay providers. We don't know what rates they're going to pay providers. It's frankly a bit of a perplexing solution when they already have a massive infrastructure to do Medicare payments, why they wouldn't just use that system, but open it up to people who are COVID related because there's already there are already rates and a payment structure and system in place. So kind of weird to lay that on top of existing Medicaid and Medicare systems, but it's how they've chosen to do it. So at this stage, it kind of seems like we're going to need to wait and see how that goes. I will say, hoping that if we get that larger pot of money for the uh, rural and um, underserved populations, we can maybe use some of that to help float providers that are really having a difficult time uh, waiting for those funds to get start flowing. But again, it depends how much it ends up in that final pot. Um, say, finally, you know, big thing will just be, uh, you know, we're looking at a lot, we're looking at a lot of outbreaks. We're starting to see more outbreaks in uh, workplace environments, such as some of the, the food production places. So we've been working closely with them uh, to try to test folks in the facilities and work with them on safety measures and PPE and whatnot. Well, PPE, they don't really have a lot of PPE, but work with them on safety measures. Um, but now that the, the the president has used the disaster declaration. There is no, there is no ability to close those facilities, which wouldn't have been our, frankly, wouldn't have been our first choice to begin with. But it's now not even a possibility, regardless of how the outbreaks happen. But fortunately, I'd say a lot of the owners of the big ones, Smithfield included, have been really good at working with us and trying to get um, testing of their employees and put up some more safety measures. Um, so really, I see that's where we are today. Next week, big focus. As I think folks know, the current executive order is set to expire next week. It'll be a big week to kind of get a sense of how the trends are looking for whether we can move into stage one of the loosening of restrictions. I'd say it, as the secretary and the governor said yesterday, they're cautiously optimistic based on the trends we've seen thus far that things are staying kind of flat, but you know, there's a long time between now and next Friday, you know, that really reinforces some of the conversations we've had um, with Dr. Fauci as well, which we were asking, you know, what's your guidance, given that we've been able to really do some good social distancing and keep our numbers lower, we're at a slow boil. And he was like, and he's like, yeah, there's not really a great answer for that other than it's working well and just be really measured in how you slowly start to lift restrictions. So again, we'll, we'll, we'll know more next week, but uh, at the moment, Governor Secretary feel cautiously optimistic that we will hopefully be able to move to phase one by the end of next week, but we will see. With that, I'm happy to pause and see if there's any questions. Thanks, Matt. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Ah, oh, gosh. You know what it is? I didn't wear my sport coat today, and that just threw everything off, I think. Um, no. no, we we appreciate it as always, Matt. Let's see if we've got any questions coming in. Uh, looks like we have a question for Jennifer from Jennifer Simpson in the chat box. Matt, do you have an idea of the number of group gatherings um, in phase two? Jennifer, that's a great question. It's something that's being looked at. I, I, 
I felt confident saying phase two would certainly be larger than 10, which was where we we're gonna remain for phase one, but whether that's 25 or 50 or something else is really still being worked on. You know, part of what we're trying to do with our measured approach is for better or for worse, some of our fellow Southeastern states have opened up a little faster than we are. So uh, well, I, I, I'm nervous for their residents. It's an option, it's an opportunity for us to see how their case numbers are growing and kind of get a sense of how their loosening has impacted the trajectory of COVID-19 in their states. So um, I, we're still working on what, what that number will be for phase two, but that's kind of why we wanted to build these phases so we can keep learning and seeing what's going on. All right, we've got another question from Michelle Rivest in the chat box, and uh, this partly is going to ask you to look into your crystal ball map. Why are legislators not allocating the full three and a half billion dollars now? Will there be a second phase of allocating federal funding, and will child care become a separate line item request in the future? Now, Matt, I know you're not elected to office just yet, but if you could <laughs> think about that for a second. <laughs> Um, you know, that, that I'll, I'll say that is a question that we've been asking ourselves a lot this week. When it's like we're, we're talking about spending federal money, why is this just a fight over it? I'd say going off the sound bites that they're saying, um, they, it sounds like they anticipate on spending the rest of that federal money sometime in a future session. You know, it sounds like they're going to be back, honestly, maybe as early as the end of the month for another round. I think we would have liked to have seen them allocate more of those resources now because we know there's a significant need and wouldn't have taken the approach they have. I don't know if we would have done the whole 3.5. I mean, the governor's budget didn't do the whole 3.5, but I think there's there's room to do more than they're mm -hmm. doing. As far as childcare being a separate line item request in the future, childcare is certainly a, a big area of focus. We're very concerned about the industry. We need to make sure there's an industry that people can come back to because that's going to be really, really critical for any, for as businesses are trying to reopen as we start to loosen the restrictions, it's going to be really important to have that industry in a strong place. So I do anticipate, at least from our standpoint, um, having that be something that we have as a line item going forward. Um, but again, can't unfortunately speak for the, the legislature. And I will say my my desires to become an elected official have waned significantly in, the, in recent years. So I'm not sure that I will ever have that title. <laughs> Great. Um, there's another question in the chat from Heather White. As businesses open, where does childcare fit into those phases? Yep, great question. So childcare uh, can, is, can still remain open. There's been uh, no required closure of childcare. I know a lot of them have had to, unfortunately, because the market's just not where it needs to be. Now, we did put some additional safety measures in place for childcare and some additional funding for employees. I know we're keeping that through at least the end of May. We'll see how things are going when we get to the end of May from both a disease spread standpoint and a funding availability standpoint. Looking at my foggy crystal ball, I would be surprised if all of the new safety measures just magically went away at the end of May because I think we're going to be living with this virus for, for the foreseeable future mm. without a cure. Uh, but yeah, child care can be open today. It will remain open. And as Michelle Rivas pointed out with her question, I think how we can support that industry. So the ones that have closed have the ability to reopen and serve people is going to be a real uh, intentional focus going forward. So it won't be as much uh, from a mandate standpoint as much as a how can we find the resources to support that industry to build capacity back up to where it needs to be. Great. Thanks, Matt. Those are all the questions I see in the chat box for now. And of course, people can always follow up. We send an email blast out after this meeting. Folks can email in questions then. Um, but I think that's it. Thanks, Matt. I'll hand it back right. to Adam. Great. Thanks. Thanks for joining us, Matt. All right, everyone. So there's our uh, weekly update from DHHS. We always appreciate getting that information from Matt and getting their perspective. Um, again, I'm Adam Sotok, Public Engagement Director for NC Child. I apologize for the technical difficulties at the beginning of this, um, but we're, we're excited that we're able to share um, some good information with you all this week during a tough time. And uh, the next speaker we're going to have is Jessica Burroughs, who works with Moms Rising and does a lot of work here in North Carolina around food security and hunger assistance. And um, Jessica, and as we all know, this is an issue that's hugely important all of the time for children and families, and especially given what's going on with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, children not going to school, where they normally get uh, meals and, 
and having access to food. We're seeing things about the supply chain come out each and every day and how that's breaking down in certain circumstances. And so uh, very interested to get this information, this important information from Jessica and, and maybe an idea too of what we can do as an advocacy community to help. So Jessica, please take it away. Thank you so much, Rob. Uh, first, just want to check, can everyone hear me? Uh, great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope that you are well. So I was asked to begin by providing context about the hunger landscape in North Carolina. Um, hold on, I have to figure out how to advance my slide here. Um, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so um, on the screen, you see Moms Rising's infographic that we developed last year. So these are 2019 figures. And just to give an overview, and I apologize in advance to those of you who are already familiar with this information, but for others. So one in eight people in the country struggles with hunger. And that goes down to one in seven in North Carolina. And nationwide, the average is one in six children struggles with hunger. That goes down to one in five in North Carolina. And in 18 North Carolina counties, one in four children struggles with hunger. And if you look to the right, it's, uh, there's a graph, 85.6% uh, of people in the state are food secure. 8.8% are food insecure. So a food insecure family does not have access to the money and resources necessary to provide enough healthy, nutritious food for all household members to lead an active life. And these families have to make tough choices about the quality and quantity of food they're able to provide. And households with very low food insecurity often have to skip meals. And you'll see that's 5.6% of households in North Carolina. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm having, uh, I'm having trouble figuring out how to advance the slide. Jessica, a lot of times you just click your cursor right on your, the middle of your PowerPoint presentation and it will advance. Oh, for you. cool. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Tricks. Okay, great. Okay. So, uh, proven policies to decrease hunger. So supplemental nutrition assistance program or SNAP formerly called food stamps is the main federal food assistance program in the US. So for most recipients, SNAP supplements a family's food budget. However, for the nearly four in 10 households that receive food assistance, SNAP is the only way for families to buy the food they need. Uh, women, infants, and children, the WIC program provides nutritious foods, breastfeeding counseling, healthcare referrals, and nutrition education to low-income pregnant women, new mothers, and infants and young children in order to prevent nutrition-related health problems in pregnancy, infancy, and early childhood. Uh, school nutrition programs are year-round programs that provide healthy meals to students in K through 12, through school breakfast and lunch, and also through the at-risk after-school meals program and the summer nutrition program. A food bank, is a nonprofit that safely stores millions of pounds of food that will soon be delivered to food pantries scattered throughout the state. And there are seven food banks in North Carolina. Okay, so I know this graphic is hard to see a little bit, but, but just wanna point out, and this graphic comes from the zone, a Jewish response to hunger, that Charity alone, uh, food banks could not possibly alone address the problem of hunger. So just very briefly, uh, the figure on the far left is 2.2 billion. That was the budget for the nation's largest anti-hunger organization. And on the far right is the number of meals, 31 meals per person per year they could feed to the number of Americans living in food insecure households. So that would be enough to provide meals to every food insecure American for one week out of the year. So just wanna point out the difference between 
uh, food banks and federal food policies. So the problem, why are people hungry? The problem is systemic and entrenched as Andrew Fisher, the author of Big Hunger, the unholy alliance between corporate America and anti-hunger group writes that one of the root causes of hunger is economic inequality driven by poor wages. And he continues, racism is a contributing factor to the disproportionate rates of poverty and food insecurity among persons of color. So hunger is about poverty, not about access to food. Okay, so now um, just providing a pre-COVID-19 snapshot of what North Carolina looked like. Okay, so 40%, over 40% of SNAP recipients are in working families. Uh, which dispels the myth that uh, SNAP recipients are not working and lazy, which you often hear. Almost 31% of SNAP recipients are in families with members who are elderly or have disabilities. Over 65% are in families with children. 32.8% of children zero to three receive SNAP benefits, and that's higher than the national average of 29.8%. And SNAP helps one in five rural and small town house households and one in eight households in metro areas. And 212,000 women, infants, and children in North Carolina participate in WIC. So also this past school year, almost a million, 903,000 children were eligible for free and reduced price lunch, which estimates to about, comes out to about 59% of children participating schools. And many of those children also receive a free school breakfast, at-risk after-school meals program and summer meals. So food banks and food pantries. So feeding the Carolinas network serves both North and South Carolina. And in both states, they provide food to 2.3 million Carolina, Carolinians facing hunger, including over 670,000 children. And so just a snapshot of one of the food banks in North Carolina, the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina has a 34 county service area in North Carolina where 600,000 people face hunger. And last year, they provided nearly 69 million meals. So one of our uh, the work in our campaign, and this was pre-COVID-19, was really um, raising awareness among people across the state and among our lawmakers of the extent of hunger in the state, which is often an invisible problem, which is why we called our infographic Opening the Cupboard on Hunger in North Carolina. So now, what's happening now uh, post COVID-19? So it, in order to address this epidemic. Okay, so right out of the gate, uh, federal policy issued uh, nationwide waivers across the board to increase access to food. And I just put up here just a few of the waivers. There are many more. And if you're interested, you can find them on the USDA Food and Nutrition Services website. But just as a quick example, uh, one of the waivers allows parents and guardians to pick up meals to bring home to their kids. Um, temporary, one temporarily waives the mealtime requirements to make it easier to pick up multiple days worth of meals at once. One allows meals to be served in non-congregate settings, so not in groups, to support social distancing. Um, there used to be a rule that said that after school meals and snacks had to be served, uh, had to be accompanied by educational activities. That requirement was waived and requirements to, uh, to renew or get on WIC and SNAP, you had to apply in person. Um, the physical presence wait was waived. Um, there have been remote benefit issuances waived. And so that's just a small example of some of the federal policies that have helped people access uh, food during this time. Okay, so statewide waivers. So I'm very proud of North Carolina. 
Um, uh, so a second round of waivers were that states had to submit plans to the federal government and then be approved. And much thanks to North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services and our lawmakers for, um, for right out of the gate uh, applying for these waivers. And we were one of the first states to get both of these waivers. So pandemic EBT, uh, that we were the sixth state to receive it. And this allows uh, states to provide benefits similar to SNAP to children who normally receive free or reduced price school meals. So this is a supplemental food purchasing benefit to current SNAP participants. And, and so extra money is put on the EBT cards of people that are already receiving SNAP and to households that where their children receive free and reduced price meals who are not on SNAP, they will be issued a new EBT card and money will be put on that card to offset the cost of meals that would have otherwise been consumed at school. And the SNAP online pilot program is a program that was being piloted in a few states before COVID-19 and it has been opened up and North Carolina was the seventh state to get approved for online purchasing of food to SNAP households. So we signed up over the last month, but are not yet up and running. One thing I do wanna point out is that nationally, Amazon and Walmart are the only improved vendors, but efforts are underway to get farmers and other small business owners and vendors to apply for and accept SNAP benefits. But this is a complex process, but it has been started. Okay, so the current North Carolina legislative session, Matt stole my thunder there uh, when he announced it already, but um, I'll just uh, say it again. So he announced that um, it, it looks like there is, a, well, okay, as of the session is moving quickly, and the House, Senate, and the governor have agreed from, for the most part on six million for the seven feeding the Carolinas food banks in North Carolina and 78 million for school nutrition programs. Uh, I just wanna note that they're still working on a compromise. So we may see some movement in these numbers. And just to point out that um, the, the six million for the food banks is what the food banks, uh, what they asked for. So they got the whole amount and uh, it's being used to purchase food that was often, uh, it was often given to them before by restaurants. But since many of those restaurants have closed, they now need to purchase it. It's being used for management, storage and transportation and additional labor since uh, many of their volunteers were elderly and can no longer volunteer. And, uh, and also that number is based on um, some of the food banks have reported that they saw up to a 70% increase in clients in just three weeks in March. So that's how they came up with the 6 million number. Okay, so school nutrition. So they received 78 million, well, they haven't received it yet, but that's the proposal on the table, $70 million. And just to take a step back, um, I wanted to point out that during the last two weeks in March alone, school nutrition staff served nearly 3 million breakfast and lunch meals, 40,000 supper meals, and more than 40,000 snacks to keep children in North Carolina from going hungry. And North Carolina School Nutrition Program and their staff continue to serve on the front lines of feeding children across the state every day, even though federal funding does not cover all the costs of food, labor, and transport. And I just want to give a quick shout out to our school nutrition heroes, because today is uh, School Hero Day and the uh, nutrition workers are being uh, championed today. So just want to take a moment to recognize them. Um, and so the, 
the current package that's being recommended is 78 million. Uh, however, school nutrition programs statewide are expending $7 million each week of this crisis. And so because uh, of the date when it started, March 14th to June 12th, it is estimated that they will expend $91 million to keep school meal programs running through June 12th. This is a difference of 13 million between what was proposed and what is necessary to keep the programs coming. So that is one of our advocacy areas that we're focusing on because if school meal services shut down and some are very close to that, uh, children and families across the state are going, will go hungry. And one other point is the timing of federal funds, they're slower to uh, arrive than state funds. So we're advocating for state funding of that 13 million because that can be channeled very quickly to the school nutrition programs across the state. In other advocacy areas, so the 6 million for the food banks addresses an immediately need, an immediate need. However, we're going to be watching and looking and see how that evolves and see if more money is necessary for the food banks. We're also looking ahead to the North Carolina summer feeding programs. So these programs have struggled in the past and an astounding 85% of the almost 1 million North Carolina children who are eligible for summer meals are not accessing them. And these are federally funded, federally reimbursed meals. So we want to increase awareness and increase access to these summer feeding programs, especially now that hunger is on the rise with the pandemic. Uh, we want to uh, elevate and promote policies that increase local purchasing. And like I mentioned before, um, increase access to online SNAP for a range of providers. Also on a federal level, we are hoping and advocating for a 15% bump in the maximum SNAP benefits now in the next care pa CARES package. Now in the Families First Coronavirus Response Bills, it allowed states to issue a temporary emergency increase in monthly SNAP benefits to the maximum al amount allowed for the specific household size of the SNAP recipients. So that's if a household was not already at the maximum. But for the nearly 40% of SNAP households that were already getting the maximum benefit, which comes to, so it's that's 40% of households, including 5 million children that were already receiving the maximum benefit, they did not receive any boost from the Families First bill. So we're asking for a 15% bump in the maximum and arguing that it would help both struggling families and the economy. SNAP is a proven form of stimulus for boosting the economy and re reducing food insecurity. It is one of the largest, most effective anti-poverty programs and can get food to people quickly. I did just wanna take a moment uh, now that we've talked about legislation that we are also focusing on shifting the narrative around who is hungry and who is to blame or not to blame for hunger. And wanted to take a quick moment to promote uh, the Voices of Hunger in North Carolina podcast that we are developing in partnership with North Carolina Alliance for Health and with support from Mazone, a Jewish response to hunger. North NC Child um, has, already promoted this blog through, promoted this podcast through a previous blog. Uh, so thank you for that. So through this podcast, we hope to remove the stigma and shame felt by many individuals who struggle to put food on the table and to really say, it is not your fault if you work hard and still can't seem to put together enough nickels to make ends meet. The problem is systemic and entrenched and COVID-19 is only shedding light on how fragile our system is. We're also using the podcast and other avenues to shift from a charity to food justice model, 
prioritizing the lived experiences of people who have faced or are facing food insecurity and moving beyond awareness. This podcast also offers listeners the tools to become informed anti-hunger advocates. And we'd like you to get involved. Um, oh, I didn't put it here, but please listen to the podcast and we can share how to access it. And join our campaign on hunger and food insecurity. Uh, you can reach out to me um, and my contact information is the next slide if you want to be involved. And also uh, we welcome you to join the North Carolina Anti-Hunger Coalition, which already includes uh, a number of food banks and food pantries, NC Child, Moms Rising, the North Carolina Justice Center, the North Carolina Alliance for Health, and Hunger Durham, and more. If you're interested in joining, uh, feel free to reach out to Whitney Tucker, who's a very strong advocate and member of this coalition, or me, and here's my contact information. Thanks so much. <laughs> Jessica, thank you. Wonderful job. And I know we've got a few questions in the chat here that I'll let Fawn get to, but I also wanted to mention that we also have put out a couple of short videos from members of our parent advisory council, parents that are talking about the importance of SNAP and WIC. And we want to get those, of course, moving around social media as much as possible. So, you know, we can raise awareness that way as well. All right. Great. This is fun. I have some questions for Jessica here in the chat box. A uh, question from Miriam Thompson. Uh, how much does the federal budget provide for school meals pre-COVID-19? And then how many additional dollars were provided in the, in the CARES Act and the recently approved relief packages? I don't have those numbers on the top of my head. I could look them up and get back to you. But also, I want to call on several of um, my colleagues who are also on the the call, like uh, Marianne, Morgan, Whitney, do you happen to have this information or should we get, should we uh, get back to them? So this is Whitney, I don't have it, but um, we can certainly get back. We have the name of the person who had that question. So um, we can reach out to you if you'll drop your um, email address, we'd be happy to, to follow up. Someone else asked if uh, we, if I'd be willing to share the slides. So absolutely, absolutely. That's uh, great. I see child, yeah. Great, Jessica, if you send the slides to Fawn or Whitney, after, that's me, uh, after the <laughs> call, then we can make sure they go out in our email blast that we send out on follow-up after this call today. Um, and then we have another question from Christina Dobson. What's the likelihood that some of these policy waivers around SNAP or WIC that remove barriers for families could be sustained beyond this crisis? Um, that's a million dollar question, I think. Yep. Yep. Thank you so much for raising that, Christina. And something that we're advocating for and um, on the national and statewide level is how long can we sustain these changes? So that's definitely something we're looking at. Um, I don't know if Whitney or Morgan, if you'd like to weigh in as well. Okay, well, that's just the million dollar question and that's yeah. what we're, we're, <laughs> we're in very interested in seeing that. Absolutely, no, thanks. Thanks again, Jessica. We really appreciate you sharing this information for all the work Moms Rising does on so many different things. If folks, if you're not really um, uh, familiar with the work of Moms Rising, then, um, you know, check them out and, you know, tell other parents and people in your communities to become a member of Moms Rising because they're a multi-issue uh, great organization here in North Carolina and all over the country advocating for things. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I, I just want to give a shout out because uh, on the right side of the screen uh, is Shayla Arias, who is, um, so she's giving this video in Spanish. She's mm -hmm. also with Moms Rising in our Spanish language community, Mamas Con Poder, and she's also with NC Child, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We we work together, and um, and this is yeah again just a, a look at these videos, the snapshots of these videos that we have out now that uh, we're trying to get get out via social media. 
Um, thanks again, Jessica, and uh, we will continue to stay apprised of, of all of those um, hunger assistance related issues. Now I wanted to kick it over to Whitney, Whitney Tucker, who is our acting policy director. And Whitney is going to talk about um, the state, po uh, state policy update and, and um, talk about the fact that the legislature has been in session, as Matt had mentioned, as everybody knows, this past week. As a matter of fact, they continue to be in session right now. And the, the latest that I'm seeing is that they really are hoping to vote on a compromise piece of legislation tomorrow, Saturday. So kind of as we speak, they're hashing out some of the final details, but Whitney's going to walk through some of those details right now. That's right. So um, Matt gave a pretty quick overview, but I'm going to go back through that for those who you know don't read or watch the news um, very much these days. So the state legislature returned to Raleigh this week to really focus on figuring out how to spend $3.5 billion that's coming to North Carolina um, through the CARES Act, which is the largest of those federal coronavirus response bills that we've talked about in some of our previous calls. So on Wednesday, the Senate passed a $1.4 billion package, Senate Bill 704. And then on Thursday, the House passed its biggest relief package titled the Pandemic Response Act, which allocates about $1.7 billion. The House package we know is the result of weeks of remote committee meetings and some coordination with the governor's office and their package more closely reflects his stated priorities. It is completely unclear how the Senate came up with its proposal, but as of last night, the biggest difference between the two wasn't the various policy proposals in them, it was their funding. Um, lawmakers, as you know, Adam already told you, um, are still meeting today to work out that $300 million difference between the House and Senate proposals and also to reach a compromise on various different policy areas within both bills. That's going to be really tough because each bill passed nearly unanimously in its respective chamber. So unlike what we usually see with partisan differences really being the hang up in bill passage, this time most of the issues up front seem to be based on an ideological disagreement between the House and the Senate on how the federal funding should be spent. As you can see on the slide here, the Senate bill puts funds into a reserve. Um, whereas Speaker Moore has made it clear that because this money from the federal government was delegated for economic relief and stimulus and is meant to be spent this calendar year, that we as a state should go ahead and spend as much as possible right now to give families immediate relief that was intended. That's in direct contrast to Senator Berger, who's already told reporters that he thinks that the legislature should stall a bit on doling out all of the funds and wait for more guidance from the federal government presumably hoping that new guidelines will allow the money to be used to shore up the state budget through COVID recovery. Now we're thinking at NC Child that the compromise here is likely going to end up holding some of the federal funding in, result, um, in reserve, at least for a few months, um, just to allow for these more immediate relief funds to be able to pass out of both chambers, but we shall see. Um, Representative McGrady actually tweeted last night that agreement has been made on the funding amount and that legislators are now focused on the provisions that should be in a final bill. But many of those you know, policy provisions, of course, have funding implications and could impact any sort of compromise that was reached last night. We don't know what that compromise is yet, so we shall see. Um, in the meantime, we are encouraged that some of our recent asks are currently in both, um, including $6 million to food banks, uh, funding for supplemental foster care payments, and increased support, as Jessica mentioned, for school nutrition, um, as well as um, additional money for small businesses that include child care centers. But there are really big areas of focus for us that have been left underfunded or completely excluded, including um, expanded Medicaid access for testing and treatment, which isn't in both um, additional funding for childcare related needs, which I think came up in a question that Michelle Rivest asked earlier on the call. Um, right now, there is some funding for childcare, but it's lumped into 25 million that goes towards several different priorities, including $6 million in the House bill that was carved out specifically for that food bank funding um, and other things like housing security and child and adult protective services 
which we obviously like to see. Um, and we think those things need to be funded, but we're not seeing a specific carve out just for childcare. And we know that that is an immediate need upon which a lot of these other economic needs really build because that's foundational to our economy and to keeping our society running really. Um, as Matt said, it's likely that legislators will come back in a few weeks to spend additional funds. That's what they've said. Um, and we're hoping to see more of those priorities funded at that point. As for right now, we're going to be releasing a detailed breakdown of the things that are currently funded in each proposal in the next Child Advocacy Network email with the understanding that the priorities and their funding levels could change before the legislature is able to pass a final package tomorrow. Based on what comes out Saturday, we'll keep you updated and be in touch about additional areas of focus that we're all gonna need to push for as the legislature figures out how to spend the rest of this $3.5 billion. Back to you. Thanks so much, Whitney. Really appreciate that, that breakdown. Um, and, you know, it's so important that at the state level, we're doing whatever we can to help these communities in need and our healthcare system, et cetera, in conjunction with what's going on in the federal level that uh, we, as we all know, it's very important that we advocate around these issues and looking forward towards the summer too. And whenever they do come back for another session uh, that we're really on top of the budgeting process and advocating for what children and families need, especially in a situation where our economy has taken such a big hit and um, you know, money and the finances, the appropriations around programs is going to be a huge, huge issue and topic of debate. Um, does anyone have any other questions for, any questions for Whitney right now? Vaughn? While we're waiting for those to come in, I do see that someone from Alliance for Health, thank you, has popped in to say that the compromise is likely around $1.5 billion which is you know, about what we were thinking as well, since the Senate bill is about 1.4 and the House was looking at 1.7. But that also means that some of the priority areas that we saw that were um, well-funded in the House proposal are likely to be taking some cuts in order to, to reach that compromise. So something to keep in mind. Yep. Um, I don't see additional questions coming in on the chat, but want to remind people that we're going to be releasing a recording from this call, video, whatever it's called, uh, today after this is over. We'll also release a Spanish language version by the end of the day. Those all get posted on our COVID-19 website, and you see the link up here for that. All the policy documents and other things people made reference to on today's call, as well as Jessica's presentation will also be available at that web link. And we'll send out a reminder email about all that later today. Um, I do see a question or comment coming in um, from Miriam. Um, and I think this is back to Jessica's presentation an important narrative change from charity to food justice. So what child programs, action, pressure, and on whom can we target today while compromises are being negotiated? Should we press for the house budget, for example? Um, Whitney, you said we're gonna be sending out more info later, looking forward to that and fighting house cuts in the Senate. So um, who wants to take that one on? I guess that would be me. I think that the, the issue here is our timeline that we're working on, right? So um, I think that we're going to really quickly try to take a look at whatever the agreed upon compromises when it comes out on Saturday. And if there are significant cuts, especially to, um, to issues like, like child programs, uh, things that impact food and other basic needs, that we'll be putting out action alerts. But at that point, um, that most of the work we'll have to do will really be building up for late May, early June when we're expecting them to come back into session to make sure that those things are funded then. Because by the time we see what this final proposal looks like, it will have been um, you know, passed. And it's very unlikely, I think, that the governor is going to reject a proposal that um, the House and Senate were able to, to come to terms on, um, on this sort of a timeline, especially when so many people have such serious immediate needs that need to be funded. But um, we'll definitely be moving forward based on what shows up in there to, to push for the things we want to see in spending that additional funding from the 3.5 billion, because we know that there is money coming into the state and we know it's supposed to be for what the thing, uh, what people really need and have to have right now. And so um, 
we'll work together on some, some coordinated messaging at that point. But for right now, I'll sit and wait and see what comes out. Maybe it'll work in our favor. Mm -hmm. um, and so that follow-up question is, do we have influence on today's negotiations? And I think it's it's important, Miriam and everybody who's listening to recognize this is round one that the legislature is working on right now. They have all stated they intend to come back for round two to make further refinements and hopefully spend out the rest of this money or a lot of the rest of this money. And so I think looking at the timeline and the fact that you have both parties and both chambers really coming together on an agreement that's kind of unprecedented, um, they're on a very short timeline. And what we think that we can have an impact on now is really looking ahead to that round two when they come back later in May or in June. And we'll definitely keep you posted on those opportunities. The Senate already does have a comment portal up on their website, and we'll share that today in the um, update that we sent to our website. So um, that should all be up on our website in the next hour or so. And I also I, want I will, to- I just wanted to add that, um, that in terms of influence and advocacy, so specifically around the hunger and food insecurity, we have been advocating uh, the past couple of weeks in preparation for this moment. So we have um, you know, organized advocacy alerts, action alerts, and sent letters from the Anti-Hunger Coalition. And we're, uh, in terms of food insecurity, um, we're pretty pleased with where, where they've ended up with. So of course we would want more, but we're, we're happy with the, the compromise. So we feel pretty good about that for now. And we're looking ahead to May and where we wanna go next. That was really what I wanted to lift up as well. The input that you guys have been giving on these calls through your questions and through the um, additional information that you share has been going straight into our letters, into our conversations directly with lawmakers. And that's why we see some of the priorities that were laid out in our early legislative letters of our ask reflected in these budgets right now. I think that we're just gonna have to do that again for round two, so you know, don't get tired. <laughs> Absolutely, there will be plenty to advocate for and around. And I'll just also say that, I, like, like you mentioned, I think we had a big impact in what went into the House version of all of this. And that we found a lot of North Carolina House members on both sides of the uh, both sides of the aisle listening and taking all of our collective recommendations into account, and I think that's a good thing that's made this package overall much stronger. Um, and we're seeing the the uh, typical situation play out that we've seen in North Carolina recently, where it's harder to. Uh, to penetrate in the North Carolina Senate with some of those advocacy asks and understand um, what's happening on that side. The other things I'll say moving forward, in addition to all of this about, you know, what's the next COVID relief package going to look like in North Carolina, there's, there's several other major things that are on the horizon. Another one would be a, a, another stimulus package on the federal front. And what will that stimulus package include? And how do we advocate with our federal lawmakers on that front and ensure the best package possible comes out of that? Because um, this economic uh, situation is going to continue, unfortunately, for quite a while. And then on the more just the, the pressing level on the day to day in North Carolina, I think unemployment and what happens when the North Carolina uh, side of the unemployment um, you know goes away and what are north what's north carolina doing to strengthen unemployment and which is affecting i mean i think there's been about a million people that have filed so far for unemployment in the last six weeks or so hundreds of thousands of which by the way will not have health insurance now so the health insurance coverage gap is also growing so i think that's a huge issue and i think the other issue the the battle is just going to be public safety I mean, folks, we have um, protesters going out now regularly saying, let's open North Carolina back up. Uh, and, you know, we're we're very pleased with how we've had a data based response in this state around what is the public safety interest here? How do we flatten the curve, et cetera? But this pressure is going to continue to grow. And I think we're going to have to, as a community, be able to talk about what's best for children and families as we as we move through the summer and into the fall. Um, so 
All of that being said, uh, we again thank our speakers today so much. Thank you, Jessica, for joining us. Uh, we thank Matt, uh, as always, from North Carolina DHHS for providing that perspective. Whitney Tucker, our policy director, who's helping keep on top of things at the state legislative level. Uh, as a reminder, if you uh, want to continue getting some updates from NC Child or keep up with information from NC Child, uh, we have a page on our website, uh, nchild.org slash COVID-19, which is up on the screen in front of you. Uh, that's a good way to stay, stay posted on information. And if you want to get on our email list and get notifications about uh, legislative updates and other advocacy uh, uh, possibilities and you haven't already, then uh, please just email Eva, uh, Eva, E-V-A at nchild.org. Um, if, there's, if there's nothing else from any of our panelists, then uh, we will go ahead and end this call and I wish everyone a happy and safe weekend. Thank you.